welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. Our featured guest today is Jamie Tennant. Based in Hamilton, Ontario, Jamie Tennant is a writer, author, broadcaster, and program director at McMaster's radio station, 93.3 CFMUFM. He's covered music, pop culture, both locally and nationally. He's also co-founded the Hamilton Independent Media Awards and became engaged in projects such as the 2015 Junos, the Polaris Prize, and Japan's Fuji Rock Festival. His debut novel, The Captain of Canoe Hill, was released in 2016. On CFMU, Jamie hosts the weekly books and literature program and podcast Get Lit. And today we're talking with him about his new novel, River Diverted. Welcome, Jamie. Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's nice to be a guest on another podcast. It's uh, <laughs> every single week I'm on a podcast, but it's me always interviewing other people. But it's very different to be in the other chair, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely can be. Very okay. strange. Well, you say you've been writing since you were a kid. Yeah. What kind of stories drew you into writing and what kept you going? Oh, gosh. Um I guess I would have written what we now call fan fiction. You know what I mean? That would have been my very first thing. I wrote uh, basically what was fan fiction of Jacob Tutu meets the Hood Fang by Mordecai Richard. It was the first long thing that I ever wrote. I, just, I think I read that book when I was what, nine and ten, and I really, really loved it. Uh, and so I thought, well, why don't I just write it with me as one of the heroes? Just, and I'll make my neighbor, who's my friend, the other hero. And so we just, I wrote this like five pages, top to bottom, side to side, single space kind of thing. No idea how many words that was, but it was really long for a 10 year old kid. And I just, I loved the experience. I thought it was so much fun to be able to uh, create other worlds, usually with me at the center as the hero. Hey, I was, you know, 10, right? So. But what kept me going, I think, it was just ideas. You know, I, I would I would finish something, and again, I'm a little kid, and then I'd turn 11, and and an idea would come out of nowhere, and I would go, oh, that's so great. I'd be so excited, and I'd just sit down, and you know, every morning before school or whatever time I could find, just, you know, hammer it out. I was so excited. Uh, and then uh, I was 12, and another idea came, and I had to do some more, and I wrote quite literally two lengthy short pieces and three novel length pieces like we're talking like you know eighty thousand words kind of thing before i was 14 which is just ridiculous i don't know it's just but it was a it was a hobby to me i didn't have to get up and go to hockey practice so that's what i was doing instead you know and um yeah i mean that kind of speed and enthusiasm i wish i had it now because it's a little hard when you're uh, in your 50s and trying to do a day job as well. But certainly um, that's what got me going until I was old enough to actually, you know, be a slightly, these are not good pieces, of course. These are not good works I, and my writing skill came, but it was great that uh, I got, had the enthusiasm for something that I did poorly, but no one expected it to be good because I was so young. And then it, 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 the enthusiasm propelled me into high school where I started going, you know, I, I could actually maybe do this well, and so on and so forth until today, I suppose. It all, all came out of that enthusiasm of a little kid. The new novel, River Diverted, is full of references to horror movies that many fans of the genre will enjoy. What is it about horror movies that works so well with your story? And which of the movie references worked into the story are your favorites? <laughs> well, I... Um... You know, it's a funny thing. I'm, I'm a I'm a weird fan of horror movies. Weird in that I enjoy them, but I'm also kind of like also kind of don't like being scared, which is sort of a weird dichotomy there. But I really enjoy uh, the ability to stretch the imagination beyond what we consider to be reality, and that's a, a lot of fun. And the, the ability to make commentary 
indirect commentary, you know, the horror affords uh, the, the director and the writer. Uh, when I was writing this, I wanted River to be a little macabre, a little strange, maybe a little bit of an outcast, even though everyone likes her anyway. You know what I mean? Like she was, she was the girl in the Slayer t-shirt and the docks and, the, and in the back of the classroom, like, you know, drawing morbid little cartoons in her, in her notebook and stuff like that. Um, but so it was kind of a chipper, upbeat person. You know, I wanted her to be this really, really unique individual. And it just made sense to me that she was interested in horror movies. And, and she's kind of based on some people that I, uh, I won't say no, but follow on on social media and things like that. Uh, so it just made sense to do it. I didn't want to overdo the references because it can be a little bit clever, clever, right? Like, oh, look, we're referenced. Every page is a reference to a David Cronenberg movie. Um, some might say I did overdo it. I don't. I, I hope I didn't. But um, the reference that works best easily for me is there's a reference to a fairly terrible film from the 1970s called Shriek of the Mutilated, which is just a silly, oh gosh, I dropped my book. I got so excited about Shriek of the Mutilated. Um, it's it's about uh, a Yeti. And I don't know, there's a, there's a some, for some reason, some kind of cult involved. I don't even know. It doesn't really make any sense. But I, I just thought Shriek of the Mutilated was a hilarious title. And I thought the, the little... Uh, the little uh, tag, the tagline for the film on the posters was also funny. It's long, so I can never remember it in its entirety. But the, the one final sentence is, death is the devil's blessing, which I'm like, okay, that doesn't really make sense. But so there was a scene in the book, something that actually happened in real life to me and my partner, my spouse, when we were in Japan and we kind of had a run in with some macaque monkeys. Uh, on our way to the Jigoku Downey Monkey Park, which is the famous park. You've probably seen the photos of the monkeys in the in like the, the hot springs. They got snow on their heads, probably taken in this place. And I was writing and I made a joke about the monkeys shrieking. And I thought, oh, shriek to the mutilated. What a coincidence. I'll put that in here. And then I realized it was about a Yeti, which is like a murderous mountain dwelling monkey creature. I thought that is one of those beautiful serendipitous moments where a writer goes, they threw that at me and I'm using it because I can't not, it's too perfect. So I really, really enjoyed getting to work that in uh, a second time when I really didn't think it would work in again anywhere. And you also cover some very dark and emotional topics as well. So your main character, River Black, sort of runs away to Japan after the death of her father, looking for a fresh start. And you've said that you have a similar experience uh, after the death of your own father. Mm -hmm. What would you say about River's experience was most like your own or how was it too different? Or, you know, it was important for you to write this, wasn't it? You know, it actually, it, it's, it's odd because uh, the importance I don't really think comes from the, uh, the the tragedy that I went through and that I, you know, had River go through. Um, when I first started writing this book, the, the death of the character's father was a much bigger deal. In fact, I was just telling someone, uh, I was just telling Nathaniel Moore about this, actually, about a scene that I deleted in which the father actually, well, the, the character comes home uh, uh, just after her father has died. But that was a really early iteration of the book, and it wasn't her, it was at him, it was a totally different narrator. And it was going to dwell more on the loss of a family member. But the more I wrote, suddenly I realized that I had the wrong narrator, it, it had to be a different character. And at that point, the whole story changed and and focusing on that particular tragedy didn't really make as much sense for me so I, I moved it sideways a bit from that but definitely that's the biggest thing we had in common I didn't go to Japan to to become a, a horror writer or change my name or anything but I I had been living in Toronto working as a publicist and and it you know it was a good job and I had a good apartment everything was great but I was suffering from these really strange panic attacks that were just sort of like, felt like I was, it felt like cl claustrophobia feels. They met the feeling of being like locked in a small space, but I could be outside in the park and I could be in, in you know, um, in, in a park in Toronto and under the brilliant sun and I would still feel this, right? So I thought to myself, well, this is terrible. I don't know how to fight this. And I went on a vacation my second time to Japan to visit friends. 
And there for the first time in the longest time, I didn't feel any of this. So I thought, you know what? Uh, obviously, I just really, really need a change of a change of scenery, and and, and hopefully that'll help me. And it did actually. I, I was pretty much okay after I went back. Um, I think it was a combination of things. I think it was grief, but it was also just being in a bit of a rut and and needing to change something and needing to look at my life from a different perspective, which certainly moving to a country where you don't speak the language is going to help you do that a little bit. So that's that's what I would say. Yeah. OK, to follow up on that, when you did go to Japan, what was sort of the biggest epiphany or most powerful experience you had living in a culture so different from your own? And did it impact the book? You know, I uh, that's a really good question. Um, which kind of dovetails, I didn't answer the entire question previously, like, why was it important to write this? This is kind of dovetailing into that. I feel like um, the biggest epiphany that I had was kind of specifically about Japan itself. Uh, I found, and I, there are my other countries might be the same as this, of course, I can't know, I haven't lived in other countries, but I found it really interesting that a culture could be so similar and so different at the exact same time. When people think about Japan, they think, oh, wow, it's so wildly different. There's all these crazy neon, you know, town squares and all these old temples. And you think about this, right? Oh, there's boiled squid in the 7-Eleven. What's happening? And then you're there for a little bit and you realize, no, it's still a 7-Eleven. There's still, everything is there, are, it, everything is kind of the same. The, the basics of life are the same, the people are the same. And you're there for even longer and you kind of go back to your first opinion, but for different reasons, because uh, I really learned that language and uh, history and uh, all these different things can actually make people think differently, use a different sort of logic, reach conclusions a, a different way than, than you do. It's really fascinating to realize that how much your nation, your history, your ethnicity, your religion, whatever, all this stuff comes together to create a certain mindset, a certain way of thinking. And I, I definitely learned that uh, in Japan, there was a lot of different ways of thinking. I was fascinated by the language. I did my best to learn it. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm okay, I guess. But I was fascinated to learn that there's no verb for liking something. You don't like something. You describe something as likable to you. But that's going to make a difference, a subtle but definite difference in the way that you think about things, right? It's no longer an active verb. It's kind of an adjective. And I thought that was really fascinating. And that's just one example. Well, all languages are like this. They all differ in these really interesting ways. I had never, knew, had never known any of this. And it was just really fascinating. Um, and I had never been a minority before. You know what I mean? Like I had never been, you know, I remember the first time I sat on a subway and looked around and realized that I was by far the only white guy. And I could see through the cars to the cars adjacent and there was not still the only white guy. And I thought, well, this is really, really neat. This is something that I, I'm really happy to be experiencing, right? So it's gonna open my eyes more, I think, to uh, maybe some of the problems we have at home and things like that. So all of these were things that inspired me so much to write this story. I mean, uh, the real importance for it, I think, was just to share what it felt like to be there in this really unusual circumstance, learning these things, but even like the more mundane day to day, it was so different. I mean, it was such an unusual experience being paid to work in a bar and, and like, I wasn't a hostess um, in the Bar Lake River is, but still, it was still kind of my job to sort of, Customers would come to the bar and I have to sit and talk to these uh, Japanese businessmen, usually, not always, but usually they were uh, men and usually some kind of like salary man or office worker. And it's what a fascinating thing to do with your, with your life. I mean, not your whole life for a couple of years, but, um, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I just really, really wanted to see if I could make that come to life. And I think in some of the scenes I succeeded. 
Now a successful horror screenwriter, River goes back to Japan 20 years later to search for the origins of a mysterious book she received in the mail, a book that shouldn't exist because she destroyed it two decades ago. But it's possible the mystery book is just an excuse to go back. What else might River be looking for? I think River's looking for, for uh, herself, for the River she thought she'd become when she first went to Japan. I think River... It, went to Japan, she was young, she was idealistic. She thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a writer. And she pretty much immediately doesn't become a writer. She's immediately off track. She's so taken aback by all this new, all these new things she's seeing. She gets this new boyfriend. She has this new best friend. Uh, it's this whole experience. And it kind of sidetracks her a little bit. Now we learn, of course, that later in life, she does become a writer, uh, but she's not super happy I guess she, like a lot of us, thought that pursuing the things she wanted would always be easy. Um, and she ends up kind of trapped in this rut. And I think that part of it, I mean, she she goes back for a funeral and that's legitimate. I think she does go back. I don't think she would have gone back if it weren't for her former boss passing away. Not a spoiler, it happens in the very beginning of the book. But what, when she's there, she's looking for the origin of this mysterious book that comes in the mail, of course. But she's also looking for, I think, where she went wrong. In the book, at one point, where they use a, a metaphor of dropping a stitch. You know, she feels like somewhere along the line, she's made an error and it's made, it's put everything off in the entire sweater of her life. And I think she's kind of wondering if, if that's uh, something that can be redone, which of course you can't. So the story also revolves around River's memories, especially of Daniel, the original author of the mystery mm -hmm. book, and a young man with a heart condition who died shortly after finishing his draft. Uh, as the story develops, we find River's memories of her time in Japan don't always line up with other people from that time. Mm -hmm. we share them. And I've certainly found that when I chat with old friends from way long ago, Sarah, that was like three parties, no. You know, <laughs> one party, you know. Um, so what what is it about working with memory appeals to you as a writer? And how do you think it shapes a good story or character? Uh, I, I think you got to love the idea of the unreliable narrator who's telling you a thing that may not actually be real. And I mean, you can do that where the narrator, narrator is purposely lying. You can do that where the narrator is just mistaken and they actually believe themselves that something has happened. Um, I, I think that's great because on the, on the one hand, you're uh, as a technique, you're actually able to hide certain things from your reader that you don't want them to learn until later, right? Which I think is uh, which is great for being able to to sort of have the narrative flow and, and have things surface at the right time. But it's also a great way to explore like why, what's the story here? Why is this person doing this? Obviously, there's a big a big memory element that I won't talk about. It's a bit of a spoiler. But um, but all the little things, I just find it fascinating. And what you said is fascinating too, though, just like learning that, you know, this memory that you think you've had for 40 years or 30 years or 10 minutes, however long it's been, you find out someone else disagrees. And so the longest time my instinct was to say, what do you mean? You're, you've got to be wrong. It took a while for me to say that, well, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you're right, maybe I'm right, but it's, I will accept that maybe I everything in my mind is not what I thought it was but that's a weird kind of like free-falling experience to, to feel if you the first few times you feel it right um and I was fascinated because when I went to Japan I did find as I, I mentioned a few times in the book that there's this whole ship of theseus thing going on it's like oh this street's exactly the same actually no the street's completely different every single business has been shuttered in the last 20 years and now it's some new business and uh there was a school here that they knocked down you didn't even notice it's gone but it's the same but it's not but it is but it's not like it's just this, it's it's the two things at once which i think is really really fascinating as well and and uh, I really wanted to explore that. This one scene where they go to go to a restaurant, the restaurants moved and they're like, well, is it the same restaurant time? Because it was a space in time and now they've moved it over here, but we don't know that space, even though it's the same owners and the same name. So does it mean the same to us? Uh, they don't know. They actually, they, they kind of go back and forth a bit on it. And uh, I've had these, these things happen where you're just not sure 
it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to wrestle with. So let's talk a little bit about Soba. How sure. did you create Soba, the river god in Daniel's story? And he also manifests to river. This is not a spoiler lead either. It starts early yes. when she returns to Japan. Um, was it based on a real Japanese folktale? Did you alter him in some way? Or Okay. So I have to go back a ways. Um, I've told this story before. Originally, the captain of Canoe Hill, my first book, and River Diverted, Technically, the two were one story, and I started writing it. I finished reading uh, Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Murakami, the uh, the great Japanese author, and I it was like a cliche kind of thing. I'd never had it happen. I really I closed the book, I put it down, I turned off the light. And suddenly, I sat pulled upright and looking for a pen, looking for a piece of paper, and I started taking notes. And the original concept was like sort of they both mirrored each other very much, and so. In both, there was uh, this diminutive little creature from the folklore of the corresponding country. How I ended up with Scotland and Japan, I'm not sure. It all came to me that one night, just in this big rush of ideas. Uh, so really, I, I think I quite literally just sort of scrolled through Japanese folklore websites looking for the appropriate little monster to have in my book because I needed to have something. Um, and then I found the Kappa, which is uh, very familiar with uh, having lived in Japan. And I thought, oh, this 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 will be perfect because both the Kappa and, of course, the little red cap goblin from the first book, are, they were a little ornery and I wanted that to be an element of their personality. Um, but I also didn't want to go overboard and make it look like I was giving some kind of Japanese folklore lesson. I mean, what do I know? I, I'm just the... Uh, uh, I'm not Japanese, it's not part of my history. So I, I wanted to include this character, but not be too beholden to any any behavior or stories. I wanted him to be his own character in, in this book. Um, so when I got to writing this book, it changed very, so Captain Nicole Hill is very much like it was in the original longer, unwieldy manuscript that I eventually had to just abandon. Um, and then I took out the two pieces and separated them. but. I wrote Captain first, so when I got around to writing River Diverted, that section changed so much, where, as I said, I changed genders of the protagonist, and um, in fact, it was Daniel, the character from the book, who was more or less the narrator originally, and I just, um, so many things changed, and with that, Soba changed, I decided that, uh, unlike in the first book, I didn't want the Kappa to be an, a, a, a What's the phrase? What would I want to say here? I didn't want him to be just a character where you went, oh, look, there's a little, there's a little guy here. Uh, he's a character in the book. I want you to not be sure that his exist that its existence is even real. Right. So, which I didn't do in the first book. In the first book, it was like definitely this this guy, but it's real. So I really wanted to to play around with that. And that's why. Usually uh, he manifests a river late at night or when she's sleeping or when she's sleepy or things like that. So, um, but I had a lot, of, I had a lot of fun. I, I, I probably could have put him in more. You saying him on the book. I'm very careful to say it. I guess that's kind of funny. I guess I'm starting to think of him as male now, but uh, yeah, I, I could have put this, this uh, creature in more, but I just finally decided not to. And uh I didn't want to overshadow River's story too much with the 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 pseudo supernatural things that I was putting in. What was the biggest challenge of writing the story on two timelines for you, and how did you go about achieving that? That was tough. I'd never done that before. That was um that was a challenge. I uh, originally, again in the in the first iteration of this idea, it was all just one timeline, and then once I switched it and it became about river, I realized that th there had to be a modern day portion. It had to be her looking back. It was, it was challenging to make sure you had the timelines straight. It was challenging to make sure that without, you know, putting the date at the top, which I could have easily done, I suppose it could have been like 1996, 2000, 16 or whatever the dates would be. Instead, I just uh, used the present tense in the present day and the past tense in the in the past and tried 
and I think I was successful. I'm pretty happy with the way it worked out. Just trying to make the flow between the chapters work as well as I could. Um, I, I'm not saying each one is as good as, as the other. There are probably some minor failures in there, but I think some of them are pretty good. They, I managed to go back and forth in a way that makes makes sense. And um, you really want to make sure the reader knows where they are in time and place, right? You don't want to confuse them with that kind of thing. So that was one of the big challenges. Um, and then tone, right? Like the tone of the present day stuff is so different. But some of the past stuff, uh, a few of the scenes at least are me remembering very warmly and fondly some things that I went through and some people that I was with and trying to get that sort of warm, fuzzy, remembering my summer camp experiences kind of feel, you know? And that of course is absent in the future. And the characters are very different. River is kind of wide-eyed and hopeful and and experiencing all this stuff in the past. And right now she's feeling kind of down and jaded and, and pressured to write this screenplay for her her uh, unfortunate ex-boyfriend. So just remembering to keep those uh, consistent, but contained into their own uh, portions, into their own timelines, their own chapters, that was a, a challenge. Sometimes you'd find yourself saying, ah, I'm writing her like she's in the wrong timeline. I need to go back and rephrase that. So that was a challenge too, but a fun one, I thought. Actually, I really kind of enjoyed it. I especially enjoyed writing Younger River because I think she's fun. I think she's just kind of this happy-go-lucky, uh, goofy person, and I enjoyed that. So sometimes I would I would let a little bit of that come through in the current day section, but I didn't want it too much because I wanted us to see, you know, different people in a way. And so um, what are you working on now? What are you challenging yourself with now? Oh, you know, I wish I was working on something right now. I'm not. Um, I do have something in, in the works that I've been working on for a while. But since the books come out, uh, I've been really busy editing, editing some fiction, um, editing some fiction for a couple of different presses. And that's been wonderful. Um, super exciting to work with authors whose, uh, whose work I was privileged enough to either be offered the job or stumble across myself in the slush pile, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. And that's taken up a lot of time, but I'm wrapping that up. So it's back to the other project, I will go. Uh, now that is a much less, uh, there's no little monsters anymore in this <laughs> new idea. I wanted to write this story that is, uh, in some ways, I guess you could say, it's a bit of an ode to the music scene and in my hometown here in Hamilton and to, to some bands that I really know and love. And it's the story of a band who aren't very popular and then become very popular, but there's some drama in between. And I, as happened with River, I finished Captain, went to River and gosh, it changed so much from what I already had written, which was probably about half of it. I've probably written about half of this new one and I'm already thinking, Gosh, there's so much I'm going to have to change. I, you just get so much more experience, and and, and you know, in, in in that time that goes by, you're like, oh, I'm doing it all wrong. I got to go back, and I've got to change everything. So I don't know what this is going to. Maybe I'm maybe I end up being a monster in it. I don't know. Who knows? But uh, I, I'd like to avoid that for at least one book. I don't want to rely on that. But no, I, I joke. But um, yeah, this is this is what I'm working on is a story about about a rock and roll band, and uh, then there's. Also, the vague idea of trying to write a third book to make these first two books to an unexpected trilogy. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but uh, my publisher, Amy, who you know, of course, uh, we agreed that that would be a fun idea. If ever a really logical, plausible story comes to mind, that I should go ahead and try that. Nothing has yet. So I'm, I'm kind of leaving part of my imagination open to that and see if something comes along. What would you like to read from River Diverted for the audience? Sure. Okay, I'll read uh, the opening of the book. This is the first thing that I ever read to anybody. And one of the first people to ever read it was Margaret Atwood, which is exciting <laughs> because I went to the Peely Island Bookhouse, the inaugural uh, writer's retreat that they did, feature her as the uh, person running the workshop. And it was called The First Five. And you were to send her the first five pages of your work and she would critique it. And um, it was absolutely a thrill when 
she gets to me and she looks across the table and she says, good idea, good opening line. And I was just like, or something of those, of that nature. I don't really remember because I think I just went, okay, great. I was like, really excited. It was just, it was, it was really, uh, it was a great moment. But um, so this is the first thing anyone ever heard from the book. Uh, and it's from the chapter, the opening chapter is called Kenichi and the Kappa, which is, uh, well, you'll see. I'm holding a book that cannot exist. That's not a philosophical puzzle or an obscure Zen koan. This book should not, cannot exist. Yet here it is, as impossible as the sound of one hand clapping. The book is titled Kenichi and the Kappa. What the hell's a Kappa, you ask? Kappa means river child, but that's a literal translation and not a helpful one. The Kappa is a creature from Japanese folklore, a malevolent spirit likely invented by parents to keep their children safe from harm. I can imagine those children listening as their mothers describe the sordid creature, its putrid fishy aroma, its nasty fondness for kid meat, sons and daughters with their eyes wide, breath stolen from their lungs. Maybe parents hoped the stories of the child-hungry Kappa would steer children away from the river. By today's standards, that's crappy, near pathological parenting. And again, you don't play by the river if you're scared of the river monster. And if you don't play by the river, you don't drown in the river. Maybe it's best if I don't have children. They would be so messed up. At some point in Japan's post-war history, the Kappa underwent an image makeover. It's as if they fed the legendary river imp to the nation's kawaii machine. Kawaii means cute. I imagine the kawaii machine as a giant Dr. Seuss meets Rube Goldberg contraption, all pulleys and levers and bellows powered by the giggles of Japanese schoolgirls. You insert an item with a flurry of animated activity and kawaii out pops his cartoonish form. Cute has copious currency in Japan. Japanese, sorry, cute has copious currency in Japanese pop culture, which is why the Kappa no longer eat children. Kappa have become Sanrio toys and mascots for sushi restaurants. Nothing about today's Kappa would keep you away from the riverbank. But, okay, this impossible book. There's an illustration of a Kappa on the white cover, a pencil sketch dashed off by Reiko one night at work as we waited for customers to arrive. In her rendering, the creature seems to be looking past me, over my right shoulder. Its back is hunched, its beak raised. Yet its eyes are soft, as if it were smiling. A creature caught between its past and its future, between its cruel history and its comic present. Above the sketch is the title, written in a bright orange font. The letters look sewn together like felt stuffed with cotton batting. It wrongly suggests the story is for children. At the bottom, in a simpler font, it says, by River Black. But, okay, here's the thing. My name is Helen Olinda Delaney, but I'm also River Black. I'm River Black, but I didn't send this manuscript to a publishing house, work on it with an editor, or even show it to my sister, and I make my sister read everything I write. I don't even possess a copy of this manuscript. There was only ever one, and I burned it down to ashes. Yet here it is, in my hands, as real as the cup that holds my coffee or the chair that supports my widening 40-something behind. It showed up three days ago, the book, not my widening behind, in a plain brown padded envelope. It has lain on my kitchen counter untouched since then. Oh, and not only did I not publish the book, I didn't technically write it either. I transcribed it from a notebook onto a computer. I embellished it, gave it a bit of color. If it were a comic book, it would say inked by River Black. This is Daniel Truman's book. Daniel, who I got to know in a tiny kitchen at the back of a hostess bar in the mountains of Japan. This story was for him and me alone. He would be mortified to know that it was published. That's what I think anyway. No one knows how Daniel would feel about anything because Daniel is dead. And that's the first chapter. Hopefully it asks enough questions of the reader that they want to keep reading to the same. Indeed it does. Thank you very much for joining us today, Jamie Cannon. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your insightful questions.
Today, we're reconnecting with a local author who was a guest on one of our earliest podcasts, Christian LaFourette. He's been writing recently as C.M. Forrest. He's the author of the novella We All Fall Before the Harvest, the short story collection The Space Between Houses, as well as the co-author of the short story collection No Light Tomorrow. His short fiction has been featured in several anthologies across multiple genres. His latest book is a novel, Infested. Here's a little about the story. Olivia wakes on her bedroom floor in a pool of vomit, head spinning. The power is off and her husband is missing. A vicious storm assaults the building, but Mm -hmm. it is nothing compared to the storm raging outside her apartment door. A parasite has begun invading, possessing the residents. It's been transforming them into twisted, murderous versions of their former selves with one thing on their mind, to kill. Now, let's hear C.M. Forrest reading a short selection from Infested. Olivia faced down the darkness and continued forward. As she did so, the wail of Mrs. Elliot's crying was replaced by a new sound, a deep shunk. The noise repeated, and then again. Again. It was a horrible sound, one which reminded Olivia of herself trying to pull a booted foot free from the mud as a child. A wet, sucking sound. A sound which had no place in a high-rise apartment building. Wanting the noise to stop, Olivia slapped the cane against a nearby wall and shouted, I've called the police, Mr. Elliot. Shunk. Ahead of her was the first of the two bedrooms. A faint glow of soft orange light came from underneath the door. It took a moment for Olivia's eyes to adjust enough to even be aware of it, but once they had, it glared like a thin horizontal beacon. Shunk. She thought about knocking, but that seemed absurd under the circumstances. Instead, she planned to grab the knob, throw the door open, and confront the old man. Before she could, though, something slammed into the door on the other side. The light along the bottom was smothered. She couldn't see the knob twist, thanks to the dusk of the small hallway, but she could hear it. A slow, persistent squeal followed by a click. The door fell open a few inches. Through the gap, Olivia saw two things. The first, and what appeared to be the source of the light, was an e-reader. The device leaned against the bottom of a highly polished wooden chest next to a bed, with a ruffled comforter hanging limply off the side. A red smear of something on the e-reader's screen had turned the normally white display a sickly orange. The second sight to greet her increased in gruesome detail as the door widened, like a picture coming into focus. Lying on the floor, her body bathed in the e-reader's light, was a woman. She wore gray exercise tights, with a large pink heart across the rear and a purple sports bra. The woman was positioned awkwardly on the ground. Her head and face had been reduced to a chunky pulp, making any identification on Olivia's part impossible. Resting against the rune of her head was an oval chunk of glass. Flecks of skull and brain, along with a healthy wash of blood, nearly covered the entirety of the object. In the dim light, the words, Willem Elliot, Businessman of the Year, 1996, could be seen. Olivia realized the shunk had been the sound of the award being driven repeatedly into the corpse's head. She raised her free hand to her mouth, her palm effectively trapping the scream threatening to erupt. Blood-stained fingers appeared around the edge of the open door and heaved it the rest of the way. Standing before her, backlit by the e-reader, was Mr. Elliot. He was not a big man, but in that moment he seemed to completely fill the frame. His bony arms and legs looked stick-like contrasted with his sagging paunch of a belly. He was wearing boxer shorts and a white undershirt, both articles of clothing spattered with blood. All these details, like individual drops of rain, were lost in the storm that was Mr. Elliot's face. His mouth hung open at an impossible angle. Several of his teeth were missing, and the corners of his lips were torn and bleeding. Multiple lines of blood and saliva hung in ropes off his chin. Mr. Elliot? She whispered. As soon as the name left her mouth, something physical left his. It appeared quickly, a shiny black head preceding a segmented body. A large insect about the size of a small cat emerged from Willem Elliot's damaged maw amid a series of retching coughs and burps. The creature climbed up the elderly man's face, horrid little legs finding purchase in the folds of his skin. It stopped once it reached his forehead. Clinging there, half free from the old man's mouth, the bug began to hiss. Olivia could not stop her scream this time. Infested by C.M. Forrest is available on Amazon or through most bookstores. Locally, it's in stock at Indigo Devonshire, Bibli Oasis, and River Bookshop. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. 
For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.